One of the things that uh, has always befuddled me over the years was the television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighbors. And I don't know if our son was ever into it a whole lot, uh, but a lot of his friends were, and probably how many of you grew up watching Mr. Rogers' Neighbors? Yeah, a lot of you. Why? I mean, it's just amazing. I, it, it's just amazing that, that it's that. And, and, and here's the thing about Mr. Rogers' Neighbors, Neighborhood. It really was not very good TV. I mean, you think about it, uh, and, and they've had technical conversations about this, is that there are only one or two cameras in play, and they don't change very often. The set is very, very drab. And let's f Fred Rogers is not the most dynamic individual on the planet. I mean, it's very monotone. The music is kind of, you know, some bells going off or whatever. And, 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 and the fact is that Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it went on for over 850 episodes for 31 years. And so every day, generations of children would tune in to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood to watch not very good TV. Why? Why is that? Sociologists, psychologists for generations have been trying to figure that out. And what it comes down to is what Mr. Rogers represented for these children. And it's a phrase that I'm going to use that I've been using all throughout the fall in the Matthew series. And it's a phrase I'm going to introduce to you because I knew I'd be preaching about this today. The thing that drew children to watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was this. He had a non-anxious presence in a chaotic world. Children are very in tune to chaos. They have an ear for chaos. And every day, there would be a half-hour program, or hour, I don't even know what it was, uh, but, but there would be this period of time when these children would be able to step aside from the anxiety of their day, of their home possibly, and come on and see a man with this non-anxious presence about him. And I, I used that phrase this fall because I believe that one of the things that drew people to Jesus was that he had this non-anxious presence. Not that he was talk like Fred Rogers, but, but rather in a chaotic world, there were people that would come around him and he would be the one that was void of any fear, of any anxiety. And the reason why I want to talk to you about that today is because we're, we're starting a Christmas series series, Christmas season series called All is Calm. And I hope that you notice the irony of that. Because it seems in the world, nothing is calm. Everything is chaotic. And the reason for that is because of the first topic this morning, and that is fear. We're afraid. Now, I know that in arenas like this, many times people will kind of puff their chest out in pride and say, I'm not afraid. Are you angry? Are you distressed? Are you irritable? Are you worried? Can you sleep? Can you not sleep? If you are any of those things, then you are afraid because fear is a pack animal. It always carries with it other things. And so if you say, I'm, I'm not afraid, I'm just angry, that anger is based upon fear. That something is going to happen that you don't want to happen. And one of the things that we'll talk about today from the book of 1 Peter is fear. And some of the things you might want to hear and some of the things you may not want to hear, I don't know. But why are we so afraid? And I've got the reason there that I've articulated in your notes if you want to follow along in the notes on the app or hard copy. The reason why we are afraid is because we are experiencing, I'm going to read this several times just because I want it to sink in. We are experiencing the withdrawals from an emotional addiction to the myth of certainty. We, as Americans, we are experiencing the withdrawals of an emotional addiction to certainty. We have become addicted. We have become addicted to a myth. And that myth is that life is certain. And what's been going on the last nine months is anything but certainty. And we're going through the withdrawals of that. 
And you think about what we've experienced. Do we even need to list it? All the things that have been going on in our world and in our country the last eight or nine months. And all of a sudden we recognize we had plans. We had aspirations. We had goals. And I had lived in the myth that I could be able to determine that those things would happen. And all of a sudden uh, that myth has been blown away because now nothing is certain. Nothing is. And that breeds fear in us. And that's why I want you to look at 1 Peter, because 1 Peter is all about fear. It's all about being afraid. It's about other things, but Peter is talking to a group of Christians, and they have every good reason to be afraid. Every good reason. For example, he insinuates this, and the list there is in your notes, but chapter 2, verse 12, when they speak evil against you as evildoers, when, not if, when they speak evil against you, Verse 12 again, do not be surprised at the fiery trouble, trial when it comes upon you. When, not if, when it comes upon you. You're going to have fiery trials as a Christian when that comes upon you. Verse 13, as you share Christ's sufferings. Verse 14 of chapter 2, if you are insulted for the name of Christ. Verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian. Chapter 3, verse 14, even if you should suffer. Chapter, chapter 3, verse 16, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior. Chapter 5, verse 10, after you have suffered a little while. In a very, very short letter, in five short chapters, Peter is referencing over and over and over again, you are going to experience trouble. And then he says in verse 14 of chapter 3, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear. Well, thank you, Peter. Appreciate that. If you hadn't have said that, I'd be afraid. Have no fear of them. And then he goes on and says, nor be troubled. That's a bold statement. If it stood by itself, it would be a useless statement. But he goes on. Verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We tend to take that verse 15 out and talk about how we need to give an apologetic response to everybody. But in the context, this is when someone is speaking evil against you. When you're experiencing a fiery trial about, uh, concerning being a Christian, be prepared. Be prepared to give a response and yet do it with gentleness and respect. I knew I was preaching on this, and so I've had to ask myself the question over this last election season, have my responses to people been gentle and with respect? I won't tell you how I answered myself. And then he says, verse 16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Peter is saying here, you as believers, as you experience trouble, as you experience trials and fires, as you're experiencing slander, as you're experiencing the bitterness and hatred of an unbelieving community, don't be afraid. He's talking to people who have lost property, they've lost jobs, they've been shunned from their families. They have been kicked out of the synagogue. They've been kicked out of their, their meetings and their temples. They've been kicked out of life. And they have been ostracized and shunned by the entire culture. And he's saying to them, do not be afraid or be troubled. But instead of that, honor Christ as holy. Instead of being afraid of them, honor Christ as as holy. I want that to sink in a little bit because here's the thing. We need to learn how to be, have a non-anxious presence in our culture. I believe that that is the greatest evangelistic campaign that we as believers can do during this time of COVID and even beyond. 
is that as this world has turmoil after turmoil and trouble after trouble, we are these people that we have this non-anxious presence, not because we've medicated, not because we drank the Kool-Aid, whether literal or figurative, but because we have honored Christ the Lord. So how do we do that? How do we honor Christ the Lord amidst a troubled society, a troubled culture? Well, I want to give you some ideas on this. And here's the thing, too. When we talk about fear, uh, our son Scott, when he was in college, he he went to college in upstate New York. And we lived in Washington State at the time. And his sophomore year in college... Um, his friend who also, a cl- and classmate, who also lived in Washington State, they wanted to drive cross-country to New York in the fall to go back to school. And his parents were kind of going, yeah, we don't like that idea. But he was, I don't know, 19 or 20, and at the time we wanted him to make man-like decisions, and it was a stupid decision, but still he wanted to do it. And so we said, okay, do that. And, and so we, we called our, our gather group and we said, hey, we want you guys to pray for Scott and Casey. They're driving across the country to go back to school. <laughs> and and, and we all, we've all experienced this. All of a sudden, people start tearing, telling us their horror stories. Oh, yeah, we did that one time, got sideswiped by a semi-truck. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we did that, and we got a flat tire in the Badlands. We were there for 24 hours with no help. And we're saying, we don't want to hear that. Because it just bred fear in us. And why? Because we know that those things are true. And so I want you to to hear me when I say, when I'm talking about not being afraid, I am not saying that your fear is not real because it is. My fear is very real. And I don't appreciate anyone saying, don't be afraid. What you're afraid of is imaginary. It's contrived. It's not. It's real. And Peter is not denying this in the letter. He's not saying, hey, listen, your fear is not real. Don't be afraid of it because it's not real. No, he's saying, oh, it's real. It's real. In fact, isn't it ironic that Jesus, almost his number one one curriculum to teach the disciples was how not to be afraid. Because fear is the other side of the coin of faith. If you're afraid, you can't trust And so one of the things that Jesus was continually trying to tell the disciples is, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. We're going to do a quick survey of this. I want to just show you all of the times that Jesus did this because the number one thing that I want to tell you about on how not to have a non-anxious presence is this. You ready? Write it down and then you can scoff. Confess the reality of death and do not fear. Confess the reality of death. And do not fear. The fear I see in our culture regarding death is the same kind of fear I'm seeing within the church. And it should not be. Whether it's responding to COVID, whether it's responding to the riots and the protests, whether it's responding to the politics and the election, there is a fear. And at the root of that fear is the fear of death. And it is just as prevalent within the church as it is in our society. And I think one of the reasons for that is because we have bought the lie. We have been discipled well by our culture to believe two things. First thing to believe is that this is all there is. This life is all there is. Our culture believes that and they drum that into us constantly and they are winning. That this is all there is and so you better hunker down because if you get COVID, you're dead. And you don't want to die because this is all there is. This is the life. And then the second lie that we have bought by our culture is that you can be in control. You can be in control of this life because this is all there is. And so you've got to make sure that you're safe no matter what from anything possible that can happen. And we as parents, we believe that about our children, that I can protect my kids. In fact, one time, soon after 9-11, I had a, a young mom come up and she had tears. I never met her, never, never talked to her after that. And you'll understand why when I told her this. But, but uh, she came up and she was tearful and she says, Pastor, I just, I just want to know how... How can, I, how can I keep my kids safe? Well, how would you respond? Would you lie to her and say, oh, you just you know, build a bubble? Just get them out of culture. Is that what you'd say? 
My response, my quick and dirty response, which if I had to say it all over again, I'd probably say it the same way. You can't. You, you, you can't keep your kids safe. And if you think you can, you've bought the lie of our culture. Oh, yeah, you can feed them. You can keep them warm. But there are a thousand different ways to die in our culture. And sooner or later, every one of us is going to find one of those ways. And so there is no certainty. But I said, what you need to do instead of try to be certain about your kids' safety is make sure that they are certain about your vibrant and living faith in Jesus Christ. The best way that you can be able to raise your children in a hostile society, in an uncertain society, is that you model for them what a vibrant, living relationship with Jesus Christ looks like. Because this is not all there is. We're all going to die, and no amount of money, no insurance policy or wellness plan or 401k is going to avoid what the light of God reminds us of every day. We are going to die. Well, Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs> but think about this. Even in our weddings, at least the weddings that I officiate at, it's tucked within really romantic language till death us do part. But in essence, what's the bride and groom saying to each other? We recognize that there will be a day when one of us will bury the other. We recognize that. We admit that. We confess that. Well, fear, as I mentioned, was the primary topic of Jesus and his disciples. Matthew chapter 8, very, very familiar story where Jesus calms the storm. And the story is that the disciples and Jesus are in this boat and they're going across the lake and a storm comes up that these experienced fishermen are convinced is going to swamp the boat. They're going to sink. And so they're bailing, and they're bailing. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in the midst of this storm? He, he's asleep. Or, you know, unless he's like a parent of toddlers, he's pretending to be asleep. But, but he's asleep, and so the disciples wake him up and says, grab a bucket, start bailing. Do you want us to die? We, we need your bucket. We need you to do this. So what does D Jesus do? Yeah, you can put the bucket down. Hey, Storm, quiet. And then Jesus says to his disciples, where's your faith? Why are you so afraid? Their, their fear was real, but why are you so afraid? Believe, have faith. In Matthew chapter 8, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, uh, Jesus is getting ready to send out the disciples two by two, you know, and, and they're getting ready to go to the villages and the highways and byways and basically preach the same sermon that Jesus was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he warned them about this. He told them, that before you go, let me, give you, let me give you a locker room pep talk. Let me just get you excited about going out. And so this is what he says. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. It gets better. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and, and, and the Gentiles. Go, guys. And then he wraps up that little locker room pep talk with this in verse 28 of Matthew 10. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So in other words, don't fear them, fear him. And if I were one of those guys, I'd say, okay, all right, but can I still fear them? Because I'm afraid of them as well. So Jesus was constantly trying to train his disciples to not be afraid because it conflicts with their faith. Another place in Matthew, and I know we're in Matthew, that's where my, my mind is at, Matthew 14. This is where Jesus walks on the water. And the text says in Matthew 14 that Jesus had to make the disciples get in the boat. He made them get in the boat. Now why did he have to make them get in the boat? Because the last time they were in the boat, Jesus calmed the storm. They were about ready to sink, and they're thinking, is this going to happen again? So they got in the boat, and Jesus is shoving them off into the water, 
And I'm guessing that they probably thought he was going to come with and jump in the boat right when it got to floating. And all of a sudden, he stands on the shore just waving the guys. And you can imagine these fishermen, these disciples thinking, why, why is he not coming with us? He says, I'll see you on the other side of the lake. And so they start rowing for the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And a headwind comes up. And they're, it's the first rowing machine. Because they're working hard, going nowhere. And all of it, they're rowing and rowing and rowing to the point where it's the fourth watch of the night. It's late at night. And they're tired. they got to be tired. Blisters on their hands. Their backs are sore. They're irritable. They're grumpy. And all of a sudden, they see Jesus on a stroll walking on the water. And it says that they were terrified because they were sure it was a ghost or a phantom. The, the word is actually phantom. They were afraid, afraid. They were terrified. And Jesus once again says, don't be afraid. It's me. I don't want you to be afraid. Now you'd think in those three cases, the disciples would learn how not to be afraid. But we know what happened to the crucifixion, right? They scattered to all four points of the compass. They saw the temple guard. They saw all the swords. They saw Peter's sword. And they said, we are outnumbered. And they scattered and through the whole circumstances of Jesus' crucifixion, there were smatterings of the presence of the disciples, but for all intents and purposes, they were gone. Even when it took, time, when it took the time to take Jesus off of the cross and to cleanse his body and to bury him, none of them were around. This is a person that they had loved for three years and devoted their entire life to him. They had learned from him. They had seen his power. And now they had heard that he was dead and they couldn't even show up for his funeral. They couldn't even take part in the burial. Why? They were afraid. Afraid of what? Dying. They were afraid to die. Because they knew that whatever happened to their master will probably happen to the students. And so they were afraid to die. But something happened between the crucifixion and the book of Acts. Because all of a sudden, when you fast forward to the book of Acts, you see these disciples, and they're going crazy with boldness and recklessness and courage. You're thinking, who are these guys? These aren't the guys in the boat who were afraid. These aren't the guys who saw the, the ghost and were terrified. The, who are these guys? What happened? Resurrection. If Jesus, if Jesus is still dead then every one of us should be in the corner of the fetal position sucking our thumb, going crazy, because we have every reason to be afraid. But for them, because Jesus Christ is alive, and he is alive in them, their souls resurrected as well, all of a sudden there was a boldness about them that presented courage and a non-anxious presence. Even standing, here are Peter and John in Acts 4 and 5, and they're standing before all of these people that they used to fear. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and they're standing before them and they are wanting to intimidate Peter and John and they're not playing. They've got this non-anxious presence. Paul in prison, he and Silas, what are they doing? They're singing. They're singing the choruses of the day. What was that? Resurrection. Paul's in the Philippian jail in Philippians chapter 1, and he's chained to a guard. He's convinced he's not going to make it out alive. Either he starves to death or they're going to execute him. He's sure of that. And so he's saying, I'm in a quandary here. I, I've got a debate going on within my own soul. Because if I live, I'm still going to preach the gospel and, and preach Jesus. But if I die, I get to go with Jesus. I'm torn. I don't know what I want. There is this non-anxious presence because of there was nothing certain in life, but there is one thing certain, and it is this. Jesus Christ is alive. You guys, the resurrection of Jesus Christ does not just play at Easter time. It plays every day, especially when everything is so screwed up. Jesus is alive. I love what one of our elders says. Phil Stolarski, you all know him. And whenever one of our members dies, he never says they died. He says they got promoted. And I love that. That reminds me. Because who would, who would ever turn down a promotion? And that's what's happening. 
And yet, could it be that one of the reasons why you're afraid is because you've bought the lie that this is all there is and I have to control it. I have to control it. That's not all that is. This life is, we are on loan. We are borrowing this life. Number two, confess the presence of trouble and do not fear. We're in trouble, folks. We all know that, right? This Christmas is going to be unlike any Christmas any of us have ever experienced, certainly probably in our nation's history. It's just weird and it's troubling what's going on. And not just the disease of COVID-19, but just the atmosphere of our own country. People are, they're not at rest. They're upset. They're angry. They're fearful. They're distressed. They're irritable. We just confess, yeah, we're in trouble. This is a troubling time and no one is encouraging you to bury your head like an ostrich in the sand and deny that it's real one of the things i love about the christmas story is that many of the christmas characters were told to not be afraid why because they were afraid zechariah don't be afraid joseph don't be afraid mary don't be afraid shepherds don't be afraid why because they were afraid Because something uncertain had happened and they were afraid. But the beautiful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. Jesus Christ has entered into our trouble. He's not this coach that stands on the sidelines and says, yeah, you go here and you go there and you do this. He entered our trouble. He entered into it. Look again at 1 Peter chapter 2 this time, verse 21. For this For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We use that with those WWJD bracelets. It's kind of out of context because, again, Peter is saying, live for Christ in his steps while you are suffering. That's the model that he gave. The model he gave was how to suffer with a non-anxious presence fearlessly. He committed no sin, verse 22. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Why didn't Jesus lash out? Why even to the point of the cross did he have a non-anxious presence? Why is that? Because he constantly entrusted himself to his Father. Should it be any different for you and me? When we see the vitriol, when we see the anger, when we see the deception, when we see the fake news, however way you want to voice that, whenever we see that, how are we to respond? We continue to entrust ourselves to him. The only reason why we need not fear or be troubled is because we have honored Christ. Jesus entered into your trouble and took on what troubles you. He took on what troubles you and me. Disease, he defeated it. Shame, he bore it. Guilt, paid for it. Judgment, owned it. Death, killed it. Everything that troubles you and me, Jesus dealt a death blow to. So that when we say, do not be afraid, we say that along with, instead of being afraid, honor Christ. Draw your eyes to Christ. Love Christ. That's not just churchianity. That's not just a church bumper sticker. That is what we do in the midst of fear. We honor Christ who entered into our trouble. I mentioned to you earlier that the other side of the coin from from fear is faith. And just for the sense of of the notes, consider this. Fear is reality minus Jesus. Faith is reality plus Jesus. If you're not a Christian, either at home or here, I want you to know we are not saying don't face reality. We're not saying, hey, listen, bury your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. We're saying, no, face it, because it's probably even worse than you think it is. But could it be that Jesus Christ is greater than you think he is? He is more powerful than you think he is. 
He is more loving than you think he is. Moms and dads of young children, you so desperate. Job one for you is to protect your children. There comes a point when you cannot, and so you trust yourself, and you allow your children to see this dynamic, living, robust faith that you have in Christ. You don't need to be afraid, even when there's something to be afraid of. You don't need to be afraid, even when there's something to be afraid of. And there's plenty in this world to make us afraid. Just watching the news for five minutes, there's enough there to make you afraid. You do not need to be afraid, even when there's something to be afraid of. Next steps. Number one, in the midst of the fear, trust Jesus. And I know that for those of you that have been around for a long time in churches, you kind of roll the eyes and in the back of your head thinking, Craig, can you be a little bit more creative than that? I really can't. I don't feel the pressure to be creative in that. It is still about Christ. Whether you've been a believer for 50 years or five minutes, it is always going to be about Christ. And the only way that the fear you and I have in our lives can be brought under control is that we be brought under the control of Jesus Christ and we entrust ourselves to him. We model that as parents. We model that as church people. We model that to our community. We model that in our homes, and our neighborhood. We model that we are entrusting ourselves to Jesus Christ. We don't puff our chests out in arrogance saying, we're not afraid. Oh, we're afraid. But we've entrusted ourselves to Jesus Christ. And he will take care of us. And that provides for us this non-anxious presence. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, you guys, I think that that is the best evangelistic campaign that we can ever do in our United States of America. And it has nothing to do with our voting. It has nothing to do with which news agency we, we, we watch. It has everything to do with that our faith is placed in Christ. Not in myself, not in my circumstances, not in my country, not in my community, not in my politicians, but squarely on Jesus Christ. That is not mental gymnastics. That is reality. So in the midst of fear, trust Jesus. And then secondly, in the midst of the mandates, don't be alone. In the midst of the mandates, don't be alone. I don't know about you, I've told you that I'm an introvert, so I, I, I have never been bored a day in my life. Because... Because I'm, I'm okay being by myself. I can always find something to do, something to read, place to go, whatever. I've never, I don't know what that is to be bored. Except maybe in a sermon. <laughs> but I have found even in those moments when I, when I am self-isolating, the fear in me, the anxiety, the anger in me, it rises to the surface more than it ought. And so I'm learning that during difficult times, during troubled times, it is, it is problematic to be alone. So do not be alone. And so that means, church folks, if you know someone, especially during the holidays, that is alone, your, your holiday traditions are blown out of the water anyway, so who cares? Start a new one. Seek them out and say, we don't want you to be alone. We, if, you, if you're concerned about covid then, then join us on Zoom. That's not the best way, but be with us. But if you're okay about COVID and being in a place with masks and, and social distance, then do that, but do not be alone. That's why I say in the midst of the mandates, I'm not asking you to go against the mandates. In the midst of those mandates, there's wiggle room for us to be with other people. So be with other people. And if you see someone, a neighbor, a relative, a church person that's alone, then offer that we don't want you to be alone. Don't be alone. Reach out to them. You know, um, when, when the quarantine first came out, we started what we called day and night. And it was every, every day, except for Sunday, it started out to be that way. And then we, we took a month leave, and then we brought it back with the morning stir. And morning stir is just simply where, where I, I meet with you for 15 minutes, and we talk about Scripture, we pray, 
and in 15 minutes we're done. It's on Facebook Live, it's on Instagram at 7 a.m. every morning, Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. I'd love to have you join me. But for those of you who have, what is, I try to remember, sometimes I forget, but what's the last thing I say? Anybody remember? Thank you. Fear not. Jesus is king. Live. Fear not without the phrase Jesus is king is registering on the dumbest statement ever made. Fear not. Why, why should I not fear? Jesus is king. And because Jesus is king, we can live. We live out our lives. We live our lives, COVID or no COVID, election or no election, fires or no fires, riots and protests or no riots and protests. We live out our lives with a non-anxious presence because Jesus Christ is king. If you're not a Christian, that offer for you, for Jesus Christ to be your king, is open to you. It is a gift that you just need to receive. All you need to bring to him is your need of him, and he will accept you. If you're bringing your good behavior, if you're bringing your, your spiritual uh, uh, resume, he says, don't, don't bother. But if you come, bring your need, bring your sin, and he will meet with you because he will enter into your trouble and he will be your king. But for those of you who are believers in the courtyard and at home as well, this is a chance for us to de demonstrate to the world that Jesus Christ is king. But the more that we yell, the more that we're cynical, the more that we're sarcastic, the, more, the less they will see of Jesus. And so may we be and have this non-anxious presence that bleeds Jesus during a difficult time of trouble. Let's stand together. It's a bold thing to read in your word to not be afraid, and yet it's probably the most frequent command in Scripture. And so, Heavenly Father, we struggle with it because there are so many things to be afraid of, and most of those things wind up with death. And yet you have done it, Lord God. You have come into our world, and you lived among us, and you you experienced and you were the recipient of all of our trouble, all of our evil, all of our violence, all of our anger. And with a non-anxious presence, you died on the cross for our sins. And then because you are good and because you are powerful, you took on that enemy that scares us to death and killed death. And so, Lord, I pray that we can be able to go from this place with the intent of having a non-anxious presence. One that does not deny reality, but rather embraces the reality that we are in trouble and that Jesus is king. And I pray that we can be able to bless our community. We pray these things in the holy name of Christ. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another that together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another. Food trucks are right there. If you're at home, it may not be too late to show up for the food trucks. We we'll hope you can be able to bless them with your business, all right? And we can be able to do that because of Christ. And because of Christ, we say together, for the glory of God. Have a great day. I love you.